You never yeah, make any money. When you sell it, when you make money, it's all Yeah, and then you sell it on a round trip, another 157 bucks. Yes. You can understand why being a broker used to be a really <laughs> lucrative profession. And that's where proprietary trading came from. Because once those brokerage fees were competed away, that was after 1976. Before 1976, fees were regulated. They were deregulated in 76. So after that, you got discount brokers. And then you got deep discount brokers. And then you got online deep discount brokers as the internet became popular. It became easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper to trade over time. And as that happened, it became easier to make money for individuals that wanted to in turn be traders, which is why I taught you how to trade. 30 years ago, I wasn't teaching how to trade in this class. I was teaching how to buy a mutual fund like on the S&P 500 and hold it because that was really the only strategy that you had as an individual that you could execute. Well, notice what happened when the commissions went down was the broker dealers had to find another way to make money which is where proprietary trading came. So you're know, learning about the evolution of the market and how the structure of the market has changed over time. Now, what's the difference between a floor broker and a floor trader? The broker is an employee of a company. The trader works for himself or herself. There are women that are floor traders as well, or there used to be. The idea is when the markets got busy and the floor traders were all tied up, actually the floor brokers were all tied up doing business, for their clients, then the traders picked up the extra volume that was coming into the floor of the exchange. And so they were like independent operators. And so it, these were small family businesses. You got a license on the New York Stock Exchange. There are 1,335 seats on the New York Stock Exchange. The high point, which was about maybe 10 or 12 years ago for the value of the seat was about 2.2 million. I think that was the highest I ever saw a seat quoted. And back in the days when you needed a seat to trade on the exchange, and the exchange was the only game in town, that license was really valuable. Today, the New York Stock Exchange doesn't sell seats anymore. They rent them, and the rental cost associated with a license to trade on the floor of the exchange is like $29.95. I mean, it's not worth anything. It doesn't take much at all to get a seat on the exchange like it used to. Back in the old days, it was expensive to buy a seat on the exchange. A couple of you, I had a couple of students who took the MBA course here maybe 15 years ago, uh, that in turn went together, pooled their money, and they bought a seat on the Chicago exchange. And I think they wound up paying six or $700,000 to buy a seat on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, but back in those days, seats were expensive, and then they operated it for a while, and then what you do is in order to cover your debt service, because you borrow the money to buy the seat, you then lease it out. So you could lease the seat to a third party, you can borrow money and cover your costs that way. We don't do that anymore, because as I say, being able to participate in a physical exchange just has no value anymore when you can use platforms like the IX, Archipelago, Instanet, I mean, any one of the other ECMs to trade. Oh, it's going to have to an annual fee. No, it's a one-time so bought the right? two and a half, the two point two yeah. million. Yeah. You you right. actually bought, you know, the right to trade. It's like joining a country club, and that's your initiation fee. There's an annual oh, after right. okay. that, but the annual after that is much lower. I mean, it's just a maintenance where you maintain the relationship with the exchange and your licensing. Was there like a limit to how many seats you could buy, or could you buy the whole exchange and then lease them all? I'm sure there were, but I don't know what it was. I mean, but you had 2.2 million, you want to invest more than that. I mean, you know, companies like Bear Stearns or Goldman or Morgan Stanley, they have more than one seat on the exchange because they got to have a seat for every one of their floor brokers that ran on the exchange. But again, that's where the Indies came from. That's where the floor traders came from. The independents would be just small family businesses that would buy a seat, handle the overflow order, and make a living by processing those overflow orders that were coming into the floor of the exchange. Back in the days when there were volumes on the floor of the exchange, you could make a decent living money. Um, you can't anymore. As I said, all of that went away because none of the trading that goes on goes on on the floor of the exchange anymore. It's all going on either in Archipelago or it's going on in the ECMs today. But that's the way the market used to look. Now, why did the market in turn reward the specialist, or how did the market reward the specialist? Well, I told you this earlier in terms of having a limit book that only the specialist could see. That started to change in 2002 and 2003. I have you reading a little article that talks about the fact that you could see 
the real-time limit book for, it was 1500 bucks a month when they first started making it public, if you subscribed to that club, Central Limit Order Book Service on the New York Stock Exchange. That kind of went away a few years ago, too, and so I think it's been since about 2005 or six that everybody has instantaneous access to the Central Limit Order Book now. And I'll get into more detail about that in just a minute. But remember, in the old days, the reason why specialists were allowed monopoly access to the limit book was so that they could price in such a way that they could maximize profit. Well, that was the return to the specialist for the risk associated with maintaining continuous liquidity in the market. And so the reason why you were willing to buy if you were a specialist when everybody else was selling was because you got to see the limit book and nobody else did. Well, when we in turn went public with the limit book, the advantage of being a specialist went away. And again, there isn't much of an advantage associated with being a specialist today, which isn't a big problem because there aren't that many securities that are traded through the specialists anymore. Now, what's the super dot? This SDOT, that's an acronym that stands for the Designated Order Turnaround System. You're going to be reading that in some of the articles that you're reading. That's the communication network that connects the specialists, the floor brokers, and the floor traders. And you're going to be reading about in 2006 or 7 when Fain opened the super dot, or opened the dot, the designated order turnaround system, to outside broker dealers, that's where the S came from. So the super in the designated order turnaround system is when they extended the specialist's electronic pipeline to broker dealers that weren't on the floor of the exchange. <laughs> Now think about what that's going to do to the floor brokers and the floor traders. If you allow electronic access, you don't need floor brokers and floor traders. Can you imagine the meeting with those 1,335 people when Payne went to them and said, okay guys, we kept the trade through rule, which you're going to learn about in just a minute, but here's what we had to give up to keep the trade through rule. We have to allow outside electronic access to the floor of the exchange. <laughs> well, let's just put them out of business, which is where those 1335 went down to about 25 people. And so that killed the floor brokers and the floor traders, which is why when you see pictures of Bob reporting from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, there's not a damn thing going on in the background behind old Bob because there's nobody that works on the floor of the exchange anymore. So those 1,335 people are literally down to a couple hundred people today. Notice, when you see the pictures of the floor of the exchange, the cotton jacket color denotes the different roles that people occupy. And so the yellow jacket, they change from period to period, so don't memorize these colors. Last time I've seen four pictures. The yellow, it's, it's like a yellow that looks like that color yellow. You know, that's you know, what the exchange officials were wearing. Those are people that work for the New York Stock Exchange that just maintain order in the exchange. The light blue and the dark blue differentiate four brokers and four traders. The light blue is a color that looks like the blue in that shirt. Those are the floor brokers and the floor traders. The dark blue, the navy blue, are the specialists. And so what you'll see is the different colors that people wear. Notice, they're not wearing suit jackets on the floor of the exchange. They still wear ties. They still wear suits to work, but you take off your suit coat when you get to work, and you put on one of those cotton jackets because they didn't know your role on the floor of the exchange. And you've got to know who the people are because you don't know all these people personally when you trade in on the floor of the exchange. So you needed the colors to be able to tell who was trading on the exchange from the people who were exchange officials, from the people who worked for the specialists. So the colors are there for a reason. They tell you the different roles that people play on the floor of the exchange when you want to trade securities so you know who you want to talk to. If I walk up to a specialist, I need to know whether I'm talking to a guy that works for the specialist 
firm or somebody who's a floor broker or a floor trader, or I'm just talking to some geek that's an exchange <laughs> official that's there to make sure that the electricity's on and nobody spills Diet Coke on the floor and on and on and on. Well, that's what the exchange officials do. They sure work for the New York Stock Exchange. That's what you're looking at when you see pictures of the floor of the exchange, and that's why they're in different colors. Now, that's it for the physical exchanges. Let's talk about what goes on over in the electronic market. The electronic market doesn't use a specialist system. They use market makers. Market makers do not have the responsibility to maintain continuity in the market. If a market maker wants to trade, you quote a bid ask spread. If you quote a spread, you're supposed to trade at that spread. But when I went down to 485 this morning, I was supposed to go 70. I was doing 80 to get here. So what you're supposed to do and what actually goes on aren't really the same thing. There are a lot of times in the old days that market makers would quote a spread, and they either quote two spreads, one for their best customers and one for everybody else, or they quote a spread that was narrow, and then they just blow you off and ignore your order. Well, as you're going to read about a little bit later, that's where the electronic system in terms of SOs came from, because you can't ignore an electronic order that comes in over SOs. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But when you read about market makers in the book, have a responsibility to trade at the spread they post. If they posted a spread, uh, they're supposed to, but they don't always do it. Even today, they don't always do it. Although, you know, like I say, you know, the rule is don't get caught, not don't do it, even though it is a violation of the exchange rule. Now, market makers don't have a central limit order book. Okay. Market makers each maintain their own limit books, which means their bid-ask spreads can be wider. Because when you consolidate into a central limit order book, you collapse the spreads because all of the limit book orders are added to the same limit book. And you need to understand how that works. You're going to see an example of that a little bit later. Market makers communicate with one another over this thing called the Quotron system using a Quotron terminal. Quotron was the company that provided the display technology for the over-the-counter market back in 1969 when the NASDAQ was created. So the electronic market hasn't been around nearly as long as the physical exchanges. NASDAQ first came to fruition in 1969. And at that time, they needed a technology company that would in turn provide the front end for the bid-ask spreads that appear on a screen. Well, Quotron was the company that provided those quotes. Quotron was later sold to Citi. Citigroup owned them for a while and sold them to Reuters, and they're currently still owned by Reuters. But Quotron is still out there. Those Quotron terminals are the display technologies that give you the bid-ask spreads on a market maker's position that you're viewing when you look at a market maker's screen. When you walk into a trading desk, there are usually three or four screens that surround you. If you're a NASDAQ person, that Quotron is the one that's right in front of you. Then you've got a CNN news feed that's off to one side. Then you've got a Bloomberg terminal that's off to another side. And if you're an active market maker where you're making a market in more than maybe a dozen or so securities at the same time, and some of these guys can maintain 20 or 30 or 40 positions at one time if they're in securities that are relatively slow in terms of the way they're trading. You'll have two Quotron screens in front of you. You'll get a CNN news feed over here, and then you'll get a Bloomberg terminal over here. That's what you're looking at when you're looking at a trader's position. And a trader will be backed up then by an associate. So if the market gets busy and you need to split that position into two, and somebody needs to jump on a desk because all of a sudden volume shoots up, that's when the second person comes in. That's what my son's doing on the London Stock Exchange right now. He's the backup guy in one of the foreign exchange markets on the floor of the LSC. 
And so that's the way you break into the market. You do that for a while, and you you know get trained, and you intern under a couple of people. And if you're any good, eventually you get your own positions, and you start managing your own positions. So anyway, that's how you break into the market in the electronic market. The Quotron is the front end. Behind the Quotron system is this thing called SelectNet. And SelectNet is the data pipe that connects Quotron terminals. And so you're going to know this stuff because you're going to be reading about SelectNet, SOS, and Quotron. SelectNet is like a virtual private network. In fact, that's exactly what it is in the language of the market or technology today. It's a VPN that provides a pipe that in turn sends information electronically. Notice all of this is done with fiber optic today. None of it's done with copper anymore. Copper is way too slow, as you're going to learn if I get far enough into this topic before the end of the semester, to permit high-frequency trading. We used to talk about milliseconds, and we're down to nanoseconds now in the market. Uh, the basic idea is select it as the tube. At the end of the tube, you've got Quotron, which is the display technology, and then you've got an input in the select net from off the VPN, which is what SOS represents. That small order execution system is the public data point of entry into select net that then goes to the SOS terminals, okay? Or the Quotron terminals, I'm sorry. Now, there are, never mind, I'm out of time. <laughs> God. Like I said, I need another week. This was a lot of stuff.